Hi, everyone. Um, my name is John Kirkulis, and I'm the uh, user assistance uh, tools architect for the cloud and network services division in uh, Nokia. And I'm going to be sharing about um, not just these things, but mostly about scaling and how we've integrated our writer's documentation builds into our company's central CI, uh, continuous integration server. So some of my um, quick background is that, yes, I have used those things in the upper left-hand side. Maybe some of you have too. The old teletypes in high school is the first computer programming um, terminal, if you will and then punch cards in college, and then, yes, I've used mag tape drives. And then um, I went to my first job out of, uh, after I got my uh, computer science degree, was with Prime Computer when mini computers started to come in, and they got to use Doctor Who for their commercials uh, before they went out of business, like all the other mini computer manufacturers <laughs> at that time. Um, and then I went to work uh, for uh, a company called NetSolve, it was a startup. And it was a network management company so that corporations could outsource their, uh, the management of their internal networks uh, to us. And then when that went um, public, I was able to afford to uh, create a computer science curriculum for a high school and did that for several years before I decided to get back um, into uh, the business world. And that was through... Um, going to work for Freescale Semiconductor, and they were making the transition from frame, unstructured frame maker to DITA. And there was a, uh, an OASIS DITA subcommittee uh, for semiconductor manufacturers, so there were a set of specializations that were being used for uh, hardware registers and so forth. Um, and I got involved in that quite a bit, and then a bunch of XSLT uh, transforms for uh, digital signature, uh, signal processing uh, documentation. And then when we were rolling data out and rolling oxygen out, um, I was a part, a uh, person who customized oxygen and uh, came up with a central way for all writers to have the same configuration. And then um, eventually wound up at uh, Nokia most recently. And, um, and that's what I'm gonna be focusing on here. So the goals is I wanted to share what we've experienced attempting to scale up um, and migrate to all to, um, to DITA along the way. Um, and if any of you have had similar issues and you've uh, challenges and you've met them in different ways, I'd love to hear about it. Um, and then also while I'm here, I, I would hope to figure out how we can strengthen the OT and lightweight DITA projects. It's a very competent, small, small group, but I'm trying to figure out how to get Nokia at least and hopefully some other companies interested in contributing more materially and, um, and financially, um, you know, if possible. Um, and then uh, before I go on, since I'm going to be focusing on uh, continuous integration, uh, I'm going to acknowledge a former uh, teammate who really put us on the map um, and really customized our, uh, our build environment for, uh, for documentation, and that's uh, David Bertalan. Um, and as someone has already said already, um, while I'm presenting, some of you may have the thought, well, why didn't you just use the hana hana, whatever? And um, there are many reasons. It just could be that we had a set of specific needs and we didn't know that there was a solution out there. Um, or we had dependencies with legacy software, like Robert mentioned. <laughs> or we had an urgent need with very, where we could narrowly define the constraints to a solution, rather than figure out how do we get a general product and then figure out how to configure it you know, for our use case. Sometimes the trade-off is to, is to go quick and small and, and uh, dirty on that. So sometimes that's happened. And also we've got a, a very heavy emphasis in our uh, business group on uh, an open source software. So um, getting the approval for commercial products um, can be a bit challenging because the first question always asked is that, is there an open source alternative? 
And then that means I have to do my homework so I can honestly answer that, that question. The other thing that has kept us from doing some things that we knew we could do better is because our uh, documentation tools developers have a very uneven uh, and varied set of skills. So if what you're needing to do requires um, a decent Java background, but you've got people who have done a lot of XSLT development, but you know, haven't touched Java or haven't touched it since college, um, if they get assigned to the project, it's going to take, they're going to have quite a learning curve. And most students coming out of university don't have any XSLT training or background. I've only had one intern that's had any experience with that from their university. And um, so let's uh, move on. I don't need to skip with the agenda. You'll see it when we get there. So again, um, there are three main uh, business groups plus a technology group. Uh, the first two on the left there, mobile networks and network infrastructure, they make, um, sell, and maintain the hardware guts of mobile networks. So underneath all your cell towers, what's sitting in the base stations, the radio things up on the cell towers, and all of that is um, the mobile networks. Network infrastructure used to be called fixed networks. So this could be long fiber optic uh, backbone networks, undersea cables, um, satellite links, um, all kinds of different kinds of network infrastructure and basic IP routing. And then the um, cloud and network services is the group that I'm in and it's a software only shop. It's the only uh, one of these business divisions. Um, and that affords us some interesting opportunities since we're not tied down to hardware like the other groups are. Nokia Technologies is what used to be Bell Labs. So when Nokia acquired Alcatel-Lucent in the deal, Bell Labs came along and was just renamed. And so they, they still do a lot of R&D, have a ton of patents, um, and that's the Nokia Technologies Group. Excuse me. Okay. So, um, so our writers, when they uh, commit and push changes to their Git repos, um, the build is automatically um, kicked off on our, uh, our division's uh, central CI uh, server farm. And it's based on Kubernetes and Jenkins, and it does software builds for our products as well as the documentation builds for those products. So when, whenever a writer says push, it gets put into the queue along with hundreds of other uh, jobs. And so um, uh, the, you know, at peak, um, they've seen as many as up to a thousand concurrent builds going on on this farm. Um, and typically on any given, you know, time sample, there's about 500 builds, not doc documentation, but software and documentation going on. But the baseline is never less than about, you know, 200. So anytime a software developer does a push, anytime a writer does a push, a build automatically gets uh, kicked off. Now, we have about 100, uh, between 120, 150 writers. Uh, some of them have been reassigned and reporting to uh, product line managers, so it wasn't as easy for me to find them in the org chart last night. But when I've watched our, our Jenkins uh, uh, graphic monitor uh, for the past week, basically no more than eight uh, documentation builds were ever running at the same time. And right now we're working on logging every single build um, um, when it happens so we can gather a lot of statistics on it to find out what's going on. And so here's a, uh, some quick numbers. So um, in the last two weeks, oops, that I sampled, uh, there were set, uh, the documentation for about 37 products was built out of a total of 64 that are supported um, in our pipeline. Um, the longest build for a single products doc set was almost 500 minutes. And I never heard of this one before, so I looked at it and there's over uh, 400 data maps at the top level in this beast. So it's something to do with 3G networks and its configuration. So uh, the shortest build could be like four minutes. 
and there's always overhead because you're, you could be waiting in the queue, depending on what the loads are, and it has to find a Kubernetes pod that meets your CPU and your memory requirements. The average build takes about 30 minutes um, across all of our doc sets. The median, which means half above, half below, is actually closer to uh, 15 minutes. And as I mentioned, we've got a number of, of writers, and they're, they're spread about um, uh, you know, in different places um, in the world. So this is something I just uh, actually grabbed yesterday. So on the left is one product's doc set. So I've had to anonymize a lot of this because I've been told don't even show product names even if the product has been out there for 10, 15 years already. So I've tried to do that everywhere I can. So on the left, you can um, see the CPU activity where at maximum it goes up to about one and a half CPU cores. Um, and then in the middle, it looks like there's a little bump and then it trails off at the end. The RAM usage, you can see something that's a bit more interesting. The yellow is basically what is um, actual. So the straight lines are what you asked for, what you requested in your pod. And then the, the yellow and the green lines there are what actually was used. And, and then the disk I.O. is at the bottom, so you could see at the end of the job, the I.O. rate went way high. So it's probably uh, could be pushing things to our, our artifactory server or elsewhere. Now, the thing that would be great to do is be able to, when you see something interesting, like on the right, you notice there's these patterns. So it's what's going on in there. So if we could relate, you know, a time here with a timestamp in the log, the Ditto OT log and the Jenkins log, we could know what it was working on at that time when this dip happened, when it let go of resources and when it had to, to ratchet it up. So you can see that it's dynamically um, uh, assigning cores and in Kubernetes, the units are called millicores, a thousandth of a core. However they do that in the background, I have no idea. but. This is something I'd like to get a, a better handle on because right now we just hope that the hardware is big iron and we don't have to worry about it, but you can be um, kind of go unconscious or be sloppy about things and I'd rather understand what's going on in there because Ditto OT has added um, certain performance optimization parameters. Like do you want to do your storage of your temp files in memory? instead of on disk. There's a lot of I.O. going on, right? So it depends on, and if you're, uh, uh, if you're using fast SSDs, um, which we are in this build farm, then you may be able to get away with, um, you know, writing to, quote, disk. But uh, RAM will always be faster. So um, I'd like to do some more experiments with that. And then uh, the parallel option that uses some multi-threaded operations in the OT. Oops. And so um, basically, I've had to blur some of these things out if you even could read it. But um, it basically shows the, the history of the last time a, a job ran. So these are all different products. Uh, sometimes a product will do a build for three different versions. If you have to keep documentation up to date for the last you know, three releases and you've made a change in one of uh, the branches, You've got to do a uh, cherry pick to cherry pick those changes to the last release before that and then the last. It's kind of low level Git plumbing. Um, we'd like to make that easier, but um, that's why you'll see multiple builds happening for a given product. Oops. And so when we uh, started, um, there were many different groups um, writing documentation uh, within just uh, CNS and um, a variety of XML uh, standards, Unidoc, uh, DocBook, uh, DITA, some unstructured frame makers, some different repos, uh, someone's using the XHive CMS, and you couldn't move writers between teams, right, because very different skill sets were required. So if you had, um, if a product, let's say, was put on hold, or discontinued and you wanted to be able to move those writers to where they're really needed for important critical, you know, you'd have, they'd have a, a steep learning curve. They'd have to unlearn the things that they've been doing automatically maybe for years now to work in this new project environment. 
So we said, let's harmonize basically on uh, the latest versions of Dita language, Oasis, no specializations. We've run into big problems with trying to migrate Dita from specialized uh, sources onto ours, just Oasis. We've had to write all kinds of scripts, so we're trying as much as possible to put that, that day off, although it does get uh, tempting sometimes. And so um, on the front end, our writers use Oxygen. We're using Dita 1.3. Um, and then a combination of Maven, Ant, and Dita OT uh, run on the client. They're using Git locally. Um, and it's talking to uh, a couple different uh, Git servers um, in our server farm. Uh, one of them is Garrett. That's from Google, by the way. Um, it's like G GitHub or GitLab, but it's Google's. Um, and uh, I mentioned Kubernetes and uh, Jenkins does the orchestration and then the scheduling of the builds. And then we have the OT as well on the back end, but this time we've dockerized it so that it doesn't have to resolve the thousands of dependencies whenever you start up again. If you just watch this recursive downloading of, um, of assets and jars and all of these, once they get resolved and put into a Docker image, then you just got to say run. And all that stuff's resolved and it shaves many, many minutes. Even though we have an internal mirror um, to GitHub, um, and some other repos, like when we went to get the Oxygen SDK um, and we wanted to establish a dependency in, in, um, in, in Maven with it, we had to ask our, our DevOps group, please mirror this Maven repo on this Oxygen site because you don't, we don't want our central CI pilot to have any exposure to the internet whatsoever because that's where new products are being built, right? So there's a, a mirror that separates um, all of that. And then Artifactory from a company called JFrog is once something is built, whether it's a documentation build that's bundled into a WAR file, a set of jars, a zip file, or whatever, um, or the software builds and you know, whatever executables or, uh, they deliver are all stored and versioned in um, Art Artifactory. And so, um, let's see here. So this, let me check my uh, time here. Okay, about halfway. Um, that's not good, but <laughs> I may be skipping some slides here rather than trying to talk twice as fast. Um, so our, our content um, is either going to be you know, handwritten, handcrafted, either by technical writers in DITA or increasingly coming from R&D software developers who are authoring in Markdown. And, um, and we had to figure out how can we use both of these formats together. And luckily, um, many years ago, Yarno created uh, the Lightweight Dita project, which is a, a plugin into uh, Dita OT. And it supports um, basically going back and forth between Dita and Markdown. And so in Dita, you can have a topic ref and you just say um, the, the href is something, 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 dot MD and format equals Markdown. And then behind the scenes, Dita OT takes that Markdown, tries as best as it can to upscale it into the closest you know, Dita um, element. And since Markdown is like your lowest common denominator kind of uh, format, mark, um, I won't even say markup, but um, if you consider a space and a carriage return as markup, maybe, um, it can be tricky sometimes. And there's no round, no round tripping that you can do with that. Um, and we've had some cases where some writers we're fairly new to Dita. They didn't know how to leverage Dita's capabilities for reuse. So all they really knew about Dita was the same things that you can do in Markdown. You just have to have a lot of angle brackets everywhere and know all these things, right? Um, and so some of them said, well, let's just use lightweight, the Dita, lightweight Dita plugin to convert all of our content for that project 
into Markdown until I found out about it and told them, you realize with our next generation um, help browser, um, we're going to need semantics that you lost and threw away when you converted all your stuff to Markdown. So you'll, you'll be able to, that content will be able to be rendered, but it won't be able to take advantage of new user assistance technologies that will require the kind of markup in, in semantics that you can embed in DITA down to the element level, right, which you can do in DITA. Markdown can handle, um, in the YAML header, uh, topic level uh, metadata, right? And that gets converted over to DITA um, metadata elements. But anything below that, um, you're going to be, um, you might be in for a big wake up call. And so we're trying to understand that and run a lot of tests. Um, Mika, who's uh, in the back of the room, has been working on our next generation um, help center. It's basically an, uh, our replacement for Eclipse help. Um, it's written in React, and it uses the same libraries that our R&D uh, developers use for our products. So the, the, um, sometimes when you're using a help system like HTML help, it's very obvious that you've launched something new and different. Right? You, you may try to match the look and feel, but it's different. And even in, if you're using a Microsoft you know, Word or Excel um, on Windows, and you use their little help, online help built into, a lot of times it just takes you off site into your browser. And even though the instruction and the help may say, now click on this thing, why, didn't, why won't you let me just do it from within um, um, you know, the help application itself that's built into Microsoft Word. So those are going to be some of the challenges. Um, and I'll get into some of this other stuff later, just in the interest of time. Um, this is the software that's kind of installed on our uh, writers' uh, workstations. Um, so they have to have, you know, Maven and Ant locally. They've got to have some Git tools locally. And of course, you know, Oxygen Author um, for the editing. And what we've done is we've used the Oxygen SDK um, to create some plugins. And so um, that allow the writers to do local builds that use all the same style sheets, all the same commands that happen in the CI environment. Um, so if they want to just to render a single topic and they don't want to wait, you know, uh, half an hour, for you know, them to get the email that says, hey, here's your deliverable. Um, and it would take you know, two or three minutes you know, locally. That's an option that they have because it's platform independent. From Dita OT all the way on up through uh, Ant and Maven. Um, and we're using and starting to use more and more uh, Synchrosoft provided plugins, especially the, uh, the terminology checker um, and uh, we want to be able to be rolling out the Git client. Um, I'm, I'm having some problems with it because of my, the way my machine is configured, so it, it, um, it hasn't been working lately, but I'm going to be getting some other writers to try it out because now the, it's integrated so nicely into Oxygen. You know, our writers have to go back and forth between Oxygen and either the command line or Oxygen and Tortoise Git, which is like a Windows Explorer um, embedded uh, Git, um, uh, has a bunch of Git commands in there. Um, and so our three, these are our three add-ons. We basically have a frameworks, and then we have uh, an actual, some Java plugins, and then our validation rules. We wanted the same Schematron rules to run within Oxygen but also run when um, in our pipeline. So we use basically Git submodules. We tell the Oxygen plugin, if you, or, if you're, or the Oxygen environment, if you're looking for your Schematron rules, we are basically grabbing that through a submodule from our repo where we keep our Schematron rules. And the same thing happens for our CI builds. It says, okay, we need the Schematron rules and it sucks it in through a git submodule and 
runs the same, the same rules, but in, the, um, in that environment. And, um, you know, we created some oxygen menus that basically, you know, locally build the current file, a specific ant target, or the same build that's going to happen out on the server. Um, I don't think people want to do that because it just takes too long on a Windows desktop. Um, and then what we did to integrate it is that when you have a project open inside of Oxygen, we take certain metadata and we use that to construct the URLs to the DevOps pages that relate just to their project. So if they're in Oxygen working on product, you know, ABC, and they say, um, go to the Jenkins job, for this, then it'll go to the Jenkins GUI and automatically go to that folder and they'll see all their, their server builds. And the same thing for the, uh, uh, the Garrett repos, the artifactory deliverables, and our uh, review server where all of our Eclipse help info centers are built. So it uses rules to construct those um, and take the writer there. Um, we're looking at ways because since Jenkins does have a HTTP um, API that we could, you know, initiate server builds from within Oxygen. That would be very um, easy to do if there was a need for that besides just pushing. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Basically, all I wanted to say here is that uh, most teams are using, uh, they create a separate Git branch for every release. However, there are teams that are moving more now to trunk-based development, where you have one master branch and you use data uh, conditions and metadata to say what release of the product does this documentation refer to. Um, that really keeps the, the, the Git mechanics uh, to a minimum. And so um, I'm going to have an alarm is going to go off here shortly. I'll need to stop when it happens. Um, so some of the things that we did, we created and started before OT had their project files. Um, and now that 4.0 is coming out, there's more of our scaffolding that we can rip out now and get rid of that because that's less code that we need to maintain. In fact, right now what we do, um, even though we still have our original uh, con document configuration interface in the front end, in the background, it actually creates OT project files and sends those to, to Dita OT to go execute. We want to elevate that so that the writers can more directly, you know, use these project files. And in some cases, we have slapped on author modes to even ant build.xml files, and um, we could do the same thing with a project file if there was a need to, and then add a bunch of functionality to it if if there was if there was a need um, and we also let people build, do builds based on wildcards basically includes and excludes so if they don't want to if they're building 400 data maps <laughs> in their product project and they have a naming conve convention and they want to go pick up a whole bunch at once without having to go through and copy and paste or do the hrefs for every single one of those, we uh, support this capability uh, to make that kind of uh, thing easier. Um, the other thing I'll mention here real quick is that um, Git is not great for uh, non-text files. So if you've got uh, binary files, blobs, um, Git can't do diffs on those and really pack them in tight, which Git really excels at. And um, now small screenshots, I've seen studies that said, you know, if it's under like 500K, um, you can probably get away with storing those in Git because um, the overhead of using a Git LFS server, which Artifactory can do, but some of our teams, you know, their R&D people say, no, you need to use Git LFS, you know. Uh, we're, we're partners together, we want you to deposit things there so we can pick them up during our builds. So, um, and then we have GitLab now. So we've got sub-modules that go back and forth. So we have um, things in Garrett, the root server is Garrett, and it has sub-modules tapping into and reusing content from these uh, this other servers, right? And so, um, and some writers now want to use Git subtrees. Um, 
which I haven't used before. It lets you basically designate a certain directory within a Git repo um, um, as something that you want to reuse in your project. Um, I'll skip this one. And so what we've done is by using this nine lines of code, and some of those are blank lines, um, it's very easy for a writer to create a Jenkins file because that's the thing that tells it how to go build on the server. Usually that file can be hundreds of lines long because you're telling it how to go check things out, um, how to push things to artifactory, but we've taken all of that and we've written some groovy libraries because that's the language Jenkins uses for its declarative um, pipeline definition. And so they can just give um, pretty minimal information and um, our, our library takes care of it. But we've added a bunch of other parameters to it. So if they want to have further customization, um, we give several levels and we even have some custom hooks because sometimes an R&D group will tell the writers, hey, I want you to build a, a uh, Docker image when the job is done and put this version of Tomcat in it and then your war file and then put that up in Artifactory for us and we'll grab it from there. So by having these hooks, you know, most of the writers can get by with the defaults, but if somebody needs some custom work done, um, we can help them write those or their R&D uh, 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 oops, colleagues can, can as well. And these are just some other, you know, custom options that are available. I'm going to skip some of this now. Um, so I mentioned Docker. Um, so we, we had this turnkey central documentation publishing pipeline. Like I said, about 64 products. But um, and, and when the builds were done, um, it would put something up in Artifactory. The, the R&D software team would have to go either be told that it was there um, and so on. So it was a lot of throwing things over the wall, right? Um, and so um, we want parts of our rendering pipeline and publishing pipeline to be able to be used in other people's pipelines. So we created uh, three layers of Docker images. One of them just has Dita OT with our plugins um, and any third party plugins. So if let's say an R&D group wants to do all the upper level stuff, they don't want to deal with Ant or Maven or any of that, um, but they want to benefit from all of our Dita OT plugins, they can just use that layer directly and not worry about the overhead of Maven or Ant. Um, however, if, if they use the full three layers, like Maven, because they don't want to touch the DitaVal stuff, they don't know what it is, they don't even want to be bothered, they have other things to worry about, they said, I'll take however the writer has configured this, okay, and just tell me where the output's going to be, and we'll grab it and we'll push it somewhere else. So we want to um, have multiple ways for that to, um, to happen. Um, and so there's a very, I had to anonymize some things here, but it's very um, simple command line and a build. If you want to build the, from the Maven layer on down, um, it's a pretty simple command and there are optional arguments um, for them. This is going down to the ant level. Um, and then this, um, I can skip this. This is the way we define documents um, by trans types and paths and did eval files and property files. Um, and then this is using the DITA layer completely, where these are DITA OT uh, parameters, if you've ever uh, used those before. Um, and so um, there are some things we'd like to improve, but I'm not even going to go into that quite yet. Um, I'll quickly mention um, that um, these are some of the plugins we've written. So one of them is for context-sensitive help. So if you use the DITA resource ID element, which is meant for this purpose, it allows a software application to say, I want to show the help page um, and refer to it by a, you know, a very understandable, unique ID, right? And then if the application, it knows what page it's on, it looks in this JSON file that we built that maps these two, and then it will bring up what it uh, needs to. Um, 
We also have implemented, uh, with some limitations, cross-deliverable links between documents. OT doesn't provide that built in because it'd be really hard to do that for the general case. But if you can nail down some constraints, um, you may be able to get by. Some of the limitations we have is if you're using branch filtering, for example, the way we're doing it right now, um, it, would, it would break. Um, so it's one of these things where we've already thought of ways to re-implement it. We can automatically generate a, all the list of all the documents that are in a particular documentation set automatically by uh, traversing the top level uh, root map, which we will call a, a doc set map. Uh, we created a FOP plugin so that we could change the version of FOP without having to wait until Dita OT's um, processes say this is a time where we update our dependencies. Because sometimes there have been FOP changes that we really needed that were really messing with certain uh, corner cases and getting out PDF output. And um, so we basically did that as a plugin so we could basically patch in um, any version of FOP that we want. Um, trademarks, uh, basically that harvests all of the, the TM elements in a document set. Um, it looks up the usage description and it adds it into our legal page so that um, you never, you don't have to depend on a writer knowing what that language is. Our products use a lot of, thank you, um, a lot of open source pro, you know, products and some of them um, are very specific. So let me uh, skip down to here. So whenever a, a writer does a build, um, uh, the, if it has an Eclipse Help Info Center, it gets pushed up to a review server. Um, and right now we have usually over 450 different war files um, on this server because every time a writer does a build, every time a, one of our developers does a build, it generates new versions of our test uh, output and all this other stuff. So it's pretty heavily loaded. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, Mika worked on is an, a front end to all these documents that are on the review server, right? We didn't have a good way to do that at all. So um, he created a rack, uh, React API that basically shows them all in a list. Um, you can do you know, searches, sorts, filtering, um, exporting, and all of this to you know, basically find the version of the build for your product that, you know, that you're looking for. And um, oh boy, I can't do this in three minutes. So I did mention something about Markdown. So I think um, I'm covered, but there's no standard for Markdown. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Whew, okay, um, then I'll just slow way down then. <laughs> when I was a boy, no. Um, so, internal documentation, not customer facing documentation, had been done for years using Confluence from Atlassian. However, it was really hard working with it, um, getting things in and out of it. Um, the version control could it could the source content couldn't be stored with the software itself, right? It was in this confluence world all to its own, and trying to sync those two worlds was really difficult. So there was a big project, um, and that group um, uh, migrated all of that stuff to Markdown and they use the mkdocs static site generator for their internal documentation. So if a, if a product R&D group says, I want to use this uh, uh, security hardened version of Redis, um, the documentation for how that product group integrates that into their product is that's the stuff that's written in Markdown. However, what started to happen is because Markdown is really easy um, like I said, some people are tempted just to go straight to Markdown and ditch DITA, particularly the ones that haven't had enough DITA training and don't know reuse. They, so to them, it's like I don't see the benefit because they really haven't been uh, taught. And we're going to be addressing that um, 
you know, we have a study going on to, to really outline the use cases where one makes sense and what the limitations are and uh, maybe under what cases you're going to have to bring stuff back and rewrite it in DITA. Um, if you want to get certain features in our next generation user assistance tools. Um, but there's no standards body that, that basically, there's a lots of different flavors and I've asked Yarno to do things, if he would, that cater to our version of that, what this group is doing. Um, but I can definitely understand the, 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 any frustration um, and the difficulty of, you know, you, you can't do it for all of these flavors, basically. Um, and so um, I, I want to use real quick a, uh, an analogy. So I don't know if any of you are a photography, digital photography enthusiasts, but um, a while ago, a, besides JPEG, at the beginning that was it when you had a, your own camera phone or whatever, um, but now this is a raw photo format. And so raw photo format has a bunch of metadata that comes along with it, right? It takes the raw sensor information uh, coming from the sensor on the camera, right? And as well as metadata about the exposure, um, the f-stops, all this other stuff that the camera basically says, this is what I was using when I captured these raw pixels, okay? Um, and then if you're a professional photographer or enthusiast, you can then take that, that rich semantic version of this, this photograph, digital photograph, and you can do all kinds of things with it in post-production. Right? You can change the exposure, you can do all kinds of things without losing the, f the full resolution because a lot of these, these cameras use sub-pixeling. So for every pixel you might you know, zoom in to see, there could be four of them sitting behind it. So if you have all of that, you could do a bunch of editing on your photograph without losing anything. But once it gets stamped as a JPEG, you can fake it by, you know, even on your phone, you can mess with exposure settings and all of that. But unless, if it's a JPEG, there's some, it'll try to fake it. It'll interpolate, it'll do the best it can. But you're not gonna get the full semantics because you don't have the full data. And so to me, Markdown is like JPEG. It's been downsampled to compress it so that it can be uh, distributed, you know, quickly over a network. But if what you're after is quality, then it's gone because it's a lossy format. And, and with DITA, if you do the semantics right, it's a lossless um, format. Um, and same thing with digital audio, right? Most recording studios now, when you used to buy CDs, right, they were all 44.1 uh, samples per second, right? That a digital uh, measure was done on the audio amplitude. And then so many bits, 16 bits, were used to record the precision of that, right? Um, and that was pretty good. Although some people who are, have good ears could always tell a CD from the real analog recording. But the recording studios now use like 196 bits or even higher. So in the, when they're doing their mastering of the final version of an album, right? They've got mega, you know, resolution to mess with. And the special effects, like a, um, putting an echo or a delay, are applied to the, you know, the high precision version of piece of information. And you can think of DITA that way um, as well. You can try to fake some things by writing a lot of markdown plugins, just like you can change the exposure of a JPEG on your phone, but it may be okay for your scrapbook or up in the cloud or to you know, post wherever you post these things. But if you're a professional, then you may need to you know, use professional level tools. So we're trying to work through the use cases of where you use one versus the other and what the trade-offs are. So I think I'll end it there. Thank you very much.